The next chapter we're going to discuss is monopolistic competition. Examples of monopolistic competition are everywhere. The clothes you wear, the fancy frozen coffee drinks that you slurp up on your way to class, the magazines you read, and perhaps even a nightclub. As a result, you may find that the theory of monopolistic comp competition to be more relevant than the theory of perfect competition, where there are many firms and many buyers. Now, perfect competition describes things like wheat and soybeans, uh, things that you don't have a lot of experience in. Now, in the last part of this chapter, we're going to talk about advertising and brand names, which is especially interesting, I think would be interesting to you as, as students, and also very useful you, for you as business students. So, if you're reasonably comfortable with the material on perfect competition and monopoly, this chapter should not be all that difficult. It's shorter than the average chapter in this textbook. So let's get started. Now, as an introduction, between monopoly and competition, there are two extremes. Perfect competition on one end, which means many firms and identical products, which is identical products is somewhat um, unrealistic. And a monopoly is one firm. I would say you'd see more monopolies than you would perfect competition, but both are extremes. Now, in between these extremes, there's imperfect competition. There's oligopoly, where there's only a few sellers that offer similar or identical products. And then monopolistic competition, where many firms sell similar but not identical products. Now, in the preceding two chapters of this, of, uh, of the or, uh, chapters in order of this text, uh, we studied the two extremes of the competition spectrum. This chapter focuses on monopolistic competition, which is one of the market structures in between the two extremes. Um, now, for examples of each market type, perfect competition, you think of things like wheat, uh, wheat uh, which is an input into bread and flour and so many other things. Um, uh, another example of perfect competition may be milk, uh, commodity items. Monopoly, on the other hand, are things like the water company, your tap water, uh, your cable TV company can be a monopoly. It can be the only one that has cable TV in the area. An oligopoly, uh, things like tennis balls and cigarettes, where there's a few manufacturers of each thing, but um, only a few firms produce. Now, monopolistic competition um, can include um, things that are a little more fun, like um, novels, books, and movies. So think of uh, publishers and production companies or as monopolistic competition. Now, some more characteristics and examples of monopolistic competition include, ooh, I'm sorry, include, um, well, the characteristics are there's many sellers, there is product differentiation, so there's a lot of advertising, and there's free entry and exit into and out of the market. Examples may include apartments, books, bottled water, clothing, fast food, and nightclubs. Another important dimension of product differentiation not emphasized in the book is location. Location, location, location. Gasoline seems like an undifferentiated product, yet several, di uh, several different gas stations charge different prices. How can some gas stations get away with charging 5 or even 10 cents more per gallon, you might ask? The answer is product differentiation by location. Imagine you're driving home in rush hour traffic from a grueling 10-hour day at the office or at school, and the orange warning light comes on indicating your car needs gas. After probably uttering a few choice expletives, you notice two gas stations at the upcoming intersection. The one on the right charges five cents more than the one on the left, but is more easily accessible. So the more expensive one is more easily accessible. The one on the left would require you to make a left-hand turn in heavy traffic to get to the station. Another, you'd have to get out of your, uh, in, in another turn to get out. Okay? How much would you save? If you buy 20 gallons, you'd save only one dollar. Alternatively, Imagine you run a gas station located in a highly residential area in which one of the few other businesses, including, you're one of, there are only few of the businesses including gas stations. If people want, ga want gas, they can buy it from you or they can drive 10 minutes to a more commercial area with lots of gas stations. Your location would then allow you to charge a higher price. So you have a monopolistically um, competitive market. You have a uh, product differentiation simply because of your location. Okay. Now, comparing perfect and monopolistic competition, um, 
you can look at the number of sellers, entry and exit into the market, long run economic profits, and the products the firm sell, and whether the, farm ha the firm has uh, market power, and the demand curve facing the firm. Now in perfect competition, there are many sellers. You can come and go in the market. There's zero long run economic profits. Um, what that means is economic profits as opposed to accounting profits. There's always going to be accounting profits if firms are staying in a market. However, the economic profits account for opportunity costs. So the opportunity costs are what draw people into and out of markets. If there's more economic profit to be made in another market, you're going to go make that other good. Now, in the long run, a perfect competition, it's zero. In monopolistic competition, it's zero as well. It means firms are settled doing what they're going to do. Okay? If they're going to make refrigerators, they're a refrigerator-making company. Okay? Now, in perfect competition, products uh, firms uh, sell identical, identical products. Now, we know a lot of different firms, say uh, phone providers, may sell identical products um, in that they all make the same phone calls, but they're differentiated, which would tell you it's more of a monopolistic competition. There's a lot of advertising. Uh, they're not identical products like a bushel of wheat compared to another bushel of wheat. So a bushel of wheat from South Carolina versus a bushel of wheat in Georgia. Those are identical, right? A firm, um, no firm has market power in perfect competition. They're all price takers. Now, in perfect competition, the demand curve facing the firm is horizontal. Okay, it's flatter. All right. Monopolistic competition there may be many sellers, just like perfect competition, and free entry and exit from the market in zero long-run economic profits. In the long run, if you make refrigerators, you're going to make refrigerators. Okay, You're not just switching up to start making cars or something. Now, the products that a firm sells, like the, the cell phone market, is differentiated. That's why you see so many different advertisements for different features that different calling plans have. Okay, It's a differentiated product. All right. Now, the firm has market power in monopolistic competition because there's not as many firms. They're not price takers as they would be in perfect competition. We'll talk a little bit more about that moving forward. The demand curve facing the firm is downward sloping. So it's more of your normal demand curve that we can illustrate both in the book and in class. <clears throat> the long run profits are zero and follows from free entry and exit. So no one's going to want to leave the market if their uh, long run profits, or no one's going to want to enter a new market if the long run economic profits are zero. Their opportunity costs just don't attract them in. And then the market power of a monopolistic competitor follows from the fact that it sells a product that is at least somewhat different from the product sold by other firms. And the demand curve facing the uh, monopolistic co competitive firm is downward sloping because the firm has a bit of market power and sells a unique variety. Still, when price goes up, people, the quantity demanded goes down. Um, <clears throat> now, looking at monopoly versus monopolistic competition, a lot of people get confused here because monopoly is practically in the word monopolistic competition. The number of sales in monopoly is one. Monopolistic competition has many sellers. Okay. Um, there's free entry and exit? No. With a monopoly, they have a monopoly. So it's no, n not easily entered and not an easily exited market. Monopolistic competition, people come and go like they do in competitive markets. Now, a long-run economic profits, there are some long-run economic profits with a monopoly. There's zero monopolistic competition. Now, with a monopoly, the problem is there's no free entry and exit, so f new firms can't just come in to, to seize those long-run economic profits. Now, does these firms have market powers? Yes, they're not price takers. Monopolists certainly can set uh, market prices and manipulate the market, and so can monopolistic uh, competition firms. Okay. The demand curve facing both are downward sloping, and when there's only one firm, that one demand curve facing the, the one firm is the market demand curve, whereas monopolistic competition have many firms and many buyers. Okay, so it's downward sloping. Again, for monopolistic competition, free entry and exit drives profits to zero in the long run. In contrast, barriers to entry prevent monopolist um, profits from being driven to zero, because they can. A monopoly is the sole seller of a product with no, no close substitutes. In contrast, a monopolistic competitor sells a product with many close substitutes. As a result, the demand for a monopolist uh, product is less elastic than the demand for a monopolistic competitor's product. A monopolistically competitive firm earning profits in the short run. Okay. The firm faces a downward sloping demand curve, illustrated here with the blue demand. Okay. 
at each Q, at each quantity, each quantity greater, uh, where marginal, marginal revenue is greater than price. In other words, when your marginal revenue is greater than your price, okay, um, you face a, a downward sloping demand curve. Okay. To maximize profit, the firm produces uh, quantity Q here, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Okay, because your 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 costs start to exceed after this equilibrium here. Your marginal costs start to exceed your marginal revenue. So when your costs exceed your revenue, you're losing money. So you operate in this area where you make all of this revenue here that is above your cost. Okay. Now. Why is the price set up here? Well, because the monopolistically competitive firm does have some market power. They can come all the way up to the demand curve, just like we talked about with the uh, monopoly situation, um, and charge a higher price than they normally would. Okay. To maximize profit, so a firm produces Q, where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, and the firm uses the demand curve to set price. So in order to find... Um, a, the price in a monopoly, m monopolistically competitive market, easy for me to say, you still do the same thing you did with monopoly. You find where marginal cost equals marginal revenue, but you draw the line just like you did with monopoly all the way up to the demand curve. Okay, And when it hits the demand curve, you come across and that's your price. Okay, So marginal revenue equals marginal cost sets the quantity you want to produce, and then you come up to the demand curve and see the price that you want to produce. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're making money, but in this situation, the average total cost curve is right here, so it is below there. So anything above that, this area and this rectangle here, you can see in this tan or brown rectangle here, is all profit. It's everything that at this point, this is the point that your chosen quantity passes your average total cost. So everything above your cost and up to the price is um, not only revenue, but profit. It's your revenue above your cost, so that would be profit. Okay, the graphical analysis of mon monopolistically competitive firms' output, price, and profit and losses is very similar to that of a monopoly firm. Just like we said, we find where marginal cost equals marginal revenue and come up to the demand curve, just like we did with monopoly. One subtle difference is that the demand curve and marginal revenue curve facing monopolistically competitive firm is likely to be flatter. Remember we said it was going to be more elastic on the previous slide. Um, a flatter than the demand curve facing monopolist. Okay, dem the demand curve facing monopolist is going to be a little more um, upright. So as the monopolist competitor faces competition from other firms selling similar products. So in this case, um, there is some exchange of one good if price goes up. You go with a competitor. So there's more elastic change in quantity. Um, a monopolistically, so here we were making money, right? We had average total cost here, um, price was up here, so that difference between that cost and the, the revenue that's above that cost is profit. Okay. Now, it's possible to operate at a loss. A monopolistically uh, operate at a loss as a monopolistically competitive firm with losses in the short run, we'll show here. For this firm, price is less than that average total cost. See this average total cost way up here? at the output where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. So this determines the quantity. We go up to the demand curve. Price is down here, but your cost is up here. Uh, the best thing this firm can do is minimize its losses because the, and the more they operate, the more money they're losing. This area here is not their profits. In this scenario, it's their losses because it's below the average total cost curve. Now, monopolistic uh, competition and monopoly. In the short run, under monopolistic competition, Firm behavior is very similar to a monopoly, all right? But in the long run, in monopolistic competition, entry and exit drive economic profit to zero. Remember, that was a key difference between monopoly and monopolistic competition. If, profits in the sh if it profits in the short run, new firms enter the market, taking some demand away from existing firm, prices fall and profits fall. Okay, it brings it back down to earth. Again, economic profits. Keyword, economic profits. They're still accounting profits. That's why people would still operate, but the economic profits... Uh, start to fall towards zero. If there are losses in the short run, some firms exit the market and the remaining firms enjoy a higher demand in prices. Okay. So there's a little give and take there. Now, um, a monopolist competitor in the long run, okay, entry and exit occurs until price equals average total cost. Again, that represents taking away that extra economic profit. Okay. Counting profit can still be there, uh, but the economic profit is gone. Um, so that profit equals zero. Notice that the firm 
charges a markup price over marginal cost, again, where marginal cost equals marginal revenue, that would be right here, but we go up to the demand curve, that's a markup. Okay? They charge that market price over mar marginal cost and does not produce at the minimum ATC, average total cost. Now you really want to, um, if you're more of a competitive firm, you want to minimize your cost, but in this situation, you are interested in producing a quantity where marginal cost equals marginal revenue, it comes up to the demand curves, that price, and just so happens that's at the point where average total cost comes in as well. So the level of output that maximizes AT, or excuse me, minimizes your average total cost is greater than the output that maximizes the monopolistic competitor's profits. Now, a monopolistic competitor is going to want to maximize profits first. Okay. Hence, we say a monopolistic competitor operates with excess capacity. Uh, we'll talk more about this topic on the next slide. So, uh, if you could, you could actually have lower costs over here, but they want to operate at the quantity that maximizes. Um, their profits where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. Now again, this is long run, so economic profits are zero. So why monopolistic competition is less efficient than perfect competition? There's a few reasons. The first one's excess capacity. The monopolistic competitor operates on the downward sloping part of the average total cost curve, produces less than the cost minimizing output. So they actually could produce more output at a lower cost, but they operate where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Okay. That's a rule of thumb that we learned in the Monopoly chapter. Now, under perfect competition, firms produce uh, the quantity that minimizes average total cost. So when you're in a perfectly competitive situation, you want to minimize cost to maximize profits. When you're in a monopolistically competitive situation or in a monopoly situation, you want to operate with marginal cost equals marginal revenue and then take that, price, or take that line on up to the demand curve, and that sets your price. Okay. Now the markup, the second reason why monopolistic competition is less efficient than perfect competition, there's a markup over marginal cost, just what I was just saying. So under monopolistic competition, that price is going to be greater than marginal cost. You're going to trail all the way up to that demand curve, and under perfect competition, price is going to equal marginal cost. There'll be no um, going up to the demand curve. So due to the markup of the price over the marginal cost, the market output under per monopolistic competition will be smaller than, so than the socially efficient output, which is minimizing ATC, um, which we're going to discuss on the following slide. But just to go back, we're going to operate in monopolies and monopolistic competition as a firm where marginal cost equals marginal revenue. Okay, you want all this revenue above your cost, okay? but you get to charge this price because the demand curve is way up here, so you have that markup. Okay. In the long run, all of this is going to come together in, this, in the same place in a competitive market. It doesn't necessarily happen in monopolistic competition. So I hope that helps. Okay. Now let's look at monopolistic competition and welfare. Monopolistic, monopolistically competitive markets do not have all the desirable welfare properties of perfectly competitive markets. Okay. This, because price is greater than marginal cost, which we discussed previously, um, or just, just previously, market quantity is less than the socially efficient uh, quantity. I mean, it doesn't man minimize that average total cost curve. We were, we were operating on that part of the curve that was still coming down instead of down here where it's at the bottom, if you remember the graph. Okay? Yet, it's not easy for policymakers to fix this problem if they try. Reason being, firms earn zero economic profits, so they cannot require them to reduce prices. It, it, would, it, it just wouldn't go over well. Um, especially in a market where you have a, a few firms or just one firm producing what you need. Okay? The problem facing policymakers is h here is similar to the problem arising in a natural monopoly. Think of like your local power company or something like that. With a natural monopoly, average total cost is always fallen, so marginal cost is below average total cost. If regulators force a natural monopoly to, uh, to price at marginal cost, it will incur losses and won't make any money, and Duke Power will turn off your power, and that would not be great. Okay, so... Um, think back to natural monopolies and why um, sometimes, or we, well, simply, you're going to operate where marginal cost equals marginal revenue anyway, go up to demand curve, there's going to be a bit of a price markup, okay? Um, reason being, in a natural monopoly where it's better off um, operating as a monopoly, um, you do want them to make some profits so they keep the power on, okay? Uh, you can't make a company operate at a loss um, for very long. So continue on with monopolistic competition and welfare. The number of firms in the market may not be optimal due to the extreme, or excuse me, the external effects uh, from the entry of new firms. So 
Um, there's a couple externalities here. There's product variety externality. Surplus consumers get, uh, it's a surplus that consumers get from the introduction of new products. It's always a new and hip thing that hits even in monopolistic competition. There's, there's a bit of a positive externality there. And the business stealing externality, losses incurred by existing firms when new firms enter the market. So um, when there's new firms in the market, some of the, some of the old firms are always going to lose some market share. So the inefficiencies of monopolistic competition are subtle and hard to measure. Okay, I'm the one first one telling you they're hard to measure. Um, and there's no easy way for policymakers to improve on market outcomes. One of these externalities is positive, the other is negative. Uh, it's not clear necessarily where, which one is bigger, whether the consumers get a bigger surplus from having our new, new products on the market, product variety, um, or if the uh, negative being the business stealing externality, which costs the existing firms. Uh, it's, it's, hard to, it's not clear to say which one's bigger. And it may, in fact, differ by industry. So it can be different for different industries. So, looking very briefly at a um, uh, just a, a one slide. Uh, well, shifting gears really here to advertising. So, um, just consider one thing about advertising. Two questions here. Um, so far, we have studied three market structures: perfect competition, monopoly, and monopolistic competition in the slide sets. In each of these, would you expect to see firms spending money to advertise their products? Why and why not? Well. Um, Perfect competition, all the products are the same, so why would they differentiate? In Monopoly, um, they may have to do some PSAs, uh, but rarely do you see, say, a natural monopoly like a Duke Power, SE, and G advertise the products. They usually advertise their company and say, hey, we're good people, but you don't see a ton of ads for that. Now, in Monopolistic competition, turn on the TV tonight, you will see ad after ad after ad with people trying to differentiate their product under conditions of monopolistic competition. Now, in advertise, is advertising good or bad for society's viewpoint? Uh, try to think, uh, you can pause if you want, or we can just talk through it. Try to think of at least one pro and one con. Okay, this is a discussion we would have in class if I use slides in class. Um, well, one pro, advertising lets you know if there's a good deal, and you let you know about um, product. You get, you get more information about what's available to you. One con could be that it's just annoying while you're watching the Super Bowl and everybody's trying to differentiate yourself. You can get a little bit too much information on stuff that you're not even interested in. Okay. Now, typically, um, advertisers try to get around this by uh, considering their target audience. Uh, that's why you see certain types of ads at the Super Bowl and certain types of ads that you will see on, say, the Lifetime Network, some, some ads that they would have there. Uh, if you ever get a chance and you're staying home during the day and you're watching TV, uh, you can get a good idea of who the advertisers think are at home. You'll see a lot of ads for um, things for people that are advanced in age, that maybe you're retired at home watching TV. You'll see some things for uh, moms who they think may be home keeping their kids. Those always offend me because I was a dad at home keeping my kids for a little while. Um, and, you know, you just see different kind of ads at different things on different shows and at different times during the day. So they're trying to hit the target audience. Now, advertising. This is fun. In monopolistically competitive industries, product differenti differentiation and that market pricing, going up from marginal cost equals marginal revenue up to that uh, demand curve, that market pricing lead naturally to the use of advertising. They have to justify that. They have to get your attention to get you to pay it. In general, the more differentiated the products, the more advertising firms buy. Okay. Think about the ads that you see. Those are the very differentiated products. Economists disagree about the social value of advertising. I don't mind it all that much. I prefer if it's um, humorous, at least entertaining. Now, a critique of advertising, critics of advertising believe that society is wasting the resources it devotes to advertising. That money can be used better to make products better. Um, it could be used to do other things. Firms, again, this is a critique. Firms advertise to manipulate people's tastes. You know, if you're easily man manipulated, maybe. And advertising impedes competition. It creates uh, the perception that products are more differentiated than they actually are and allows higher markups. To me, I don't buy that. Um, I like the advertising because if Samsung advertises their phone, it makes Apple um, think about what they're doing with their phone and vice versa. Okay, so it kind of pushes innovation in my mind. So I think it actually increases competition, but that's my, just my normative statement. Now, a defense of advertising, defenders of advertising believe it provides useful information to buyers. Informed buyers can more easily find and exploit price differences. That's true. If 
find a good deal through advertising, and thus advertising promotes competition and reduces market power. Some good points, I think. Some results from a prominent study is that eyeglasses were more expensive in states that prohibited advertising for by eyeglass makers than those states that did not restrict advertising. That's a pretty good feather in the hat of those that say advertising increases competition. I tend to lean in that direction. Now, the study mentioned here was done by economist Lee Benham, and it was published in the Journal of Law and Economics in 1972. So we're talking in the Wayback Machine. So perhaps maybe those eyeglass people learned from that and are advertising now um, because they, they figured out that, that people are interested in that and it creates competition. So that's good for you, the consumer. The textbook has a nice case study that discusses this research in more detail, so be sure you take a look at that. Now, advertising as a signal of quality, a firm's willingness to spend huge amounts on advertising may signal that the quality of its product to, may signal the quality of its product to consumers, regardless of the content of the ads. If you spend money on ads, you must believe in your product, right? Ads may convince buyers to try one uh, product at least once, but the product must be of high quality for people to become repeat buyers. You're selective. The most expensive ads are not worthwhile unless they lead to repeat buyers. So you're not really putting out ads in the Super Bowl to see if somebody will buy one thing from you. You want them to buy a lot of things from you. So when consumers see expensive ads, they, they must think the product must be good if the company's willing to spend that money on them. I'm sorry, part of this slide is cut off. And there's nothing I can do about it. I'll just read it to you. So when a consumer sees an expensive ads, they think that the product must be good if the company is willing to spend so much on advertising. Because if you know if their product was not very good, would they advertise it? Would they spend millions of dollars advertising it on the Super Bowl? Probably not. Brand names. Um, in many markets, brand name products coexist with generic ones. Okay, you can go to your local Target and see the generic brands of something and the name brands. Okay. Uh, firms with brand names usually spend more on advertising and charge higher prices for the products. As with advertising, there's a disagreement about the economics of the brand names. A critique of brand names is that uh, brand names cause consumers to perceive differences that don't really exist. Maybe, maybe not. Consumers' willingness to pay for a brand name is irrational and fosters, is an irrationality is fostered by advertising. And eliminating government protection of trademarks would reduce influence of brand names and result in lower prices. Uh, I would contend with that one. If you eliminate the brand names, what's their incentive to enter a market? Because generally the generics come after the brand names, not the other way around. Now, defense of brand names. Brand names provide information about quality to consumers. And, consu and companies with brand names have incentive to maintain quality to protect the reputation of their brand name. Okay, Think about something that's gotten a bad reputation. Didn't work out too well for them in the long run, did it? All right, so conclusion. Differentiated products are everywhere. Uh, there's a, we have examples of monopolistic competition abound. We've talked about several of them through here. So the theory of monopolistic competition describes many markets in the economy, yet it offers little guidance to policymakers looking to improve the market's allocation of resources. Okay. May not be a bad thing. Sometimes policymakers screw up more than they make better, but that's between you and I and anyone watching this, I guess. So in summary, a monopolistically competitive market has many firms, uh, differentiated products, and free entry. Each firm in a monopolistically competitive market has, less cap has, has excess capacity, meaning it produces less than the quantity that minimizes ATC. They produce for marginal cost equals marginal revenue, just like a monopoly. And each firm charges a price above marginal cost, just like a monopoly. Monopolistic competition does not have all the desirable welfare properties of perfect competition. Now, welfare, we're talking about economic welfare here. Think consumer per surplus, producer surplus, and deadweight loss. There can be a deadweight loss caused by the market price over marginal cost. Okay, that's a total overall loss in surplus. Also, the number of firms and thus varieties can be too large or too small. There's no clear way for policymakers to improve the market outcome. Now, product differentiation and market pricing lead to the use of advertising and brand names. Critics of advertising and brand names argue that firms use them to reduce competition and take advantage of the consumer's irrationality. Enhances that, stokes it, if you will. I don't necessarily agree with that. I'm more of a defender who argue, uh, defenders argue that firms use them to inform consumers and compete more vigorously on pricing product, product quality, which to me is always a good thing. All right, 
So that concludes this video on monopolistic competition, very short chapter. Um, I, w I wish to point out that we, um, if you may notice here, it says chapter 16. In your book, it, it may be a different chapter number. I use the big book that has both the text for macro and microeconomics. Um, so from this point on, we're going to really diverge whether you're in micro or macro um, or essentials of economics. Um, economic concepts just uh, concentrate on monopolistic competition the the chapter title um and and if if this chapter number doesn't mess match up with your book no worries okay um this is still the same chapter in your book discussing monopolistic competition as always if you have any questions give me a phone call or shoot me an email i'll be happy to respond um thank you so much and i hope you're having a great day